The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, the ghost in the machine gears down instead of using the brakes, and the transmission of time grinds to pieces and its parts scatter across the asphalt of forever. Plus, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. And I'm Bain Editorial Assistant Christopher Rocchio. Hey, we have a retrospective on the alternate history writer Robert Conroy um, with author J.R. Dunn, who's completing the Civil War alternate history novel Bob Conroy was working on when he died of cancer in late 2014. Jeff Dunn, who is the author of three great SF books himself, including time travel novel Days of Cain, was the copy editor on the past five Conroy novels that we've done here at Bain. We discuss in particular Bob Conroy's 1882 Custer in Chains, which is now out in mass market at booksellers. And we talk about how Jeff is coming along as co-author in the completion of Bob Conroy's final incomplete novel, tentatively titled The Fourth Day. It's a great discussion, so that's coming up. And, of course, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. Closing in on the finale now, here's the news. Hey, I thought we'd talk a bit with Christopher Rocchio, who is our social media guru here at Bain. Christopher has been trying to up our game in that area, and I think succeeding. Christopher, can you tell us about some of what you've been doing and how people can connect with Bain and find out more about the books they love via social media and stuff like that? Absolutely, but first I should say that Guru might be overstating it, but I am doing my best. Uh, for now, we've been focusing our efforts on Facebook and Twitter, those being the most text-friendly social media. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash banebooks and on Twitter at banebooks. That's what the at sign before the words banebooks. We try to bring you several tweets a day and one larger Facebook news story. Links to the short stories, nonfiction on the website, for instance, uh, news about author appearances at conventions and book signings, etc., Really, they're just a way to get you all of your Bane-related news while you're stuck between newsletters and waiting for a big update. That being said, there's information on there you won't find in the newsletters. Again, there's this emphasis on author appearances and conventions. We try to keep you up to date. And there are even contests, uh, separate from the contests in the newsletter. We've been giving away books on Goodreads, and you can get the word on that through our Facebook and Twitter platforms. And right now, we're also looking for an artist who can make a GIF. That's one of those animated little moving pictures. Uh, one of a rocket exploding. More info on that can be found on the Facebook page as well. And that particular contest has a $500 cash prize. What in the heck would we use such a thing for, Chris? Well, you know, we have this uh, great slideshow we run at all of our convention road shows. You, of course, have delivered it yourself, Tony, uh, several times. Uh, and we just really we wanted something to set it off a little bit. And we thought... What better way than blowing something up? Uh, especially a spaceship. Especially a spaceship. You know, you couldn't pick something more fitting. So, if you're listening out there and you are an artist or you know an artist, uh, definitely send them our way. It should be animated and not just a drawing. Obviously. Yeah, not just a static it's, image. And we want it to uh, to really blow up when we uh, start the slideshow up to uh, get everybody's attention when we're doing the Bane Traveling Roadshow at conventions. All right. And again, if you haven't checked us out, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash banebooks and on Twitter at banebooks. Uh, so give it a look. I want to welcome J.R. Dunn to the podcast. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Tony. How are you doing? J.R. Dunn is a novelist, editor, and political commentator, active both in print and online. He's a consulting editor at The American Thinker, writing on military affairs, contemporary politics, conservative political theory, and liberal scandals and misbehavior. He's also written several essays for Bain.com on the future of the military in the future. 
These columns have been reprinted, linked, and discussed in publications as varied as Real Clear Politics, The New York Times, USA Today, and The Daily Telegraph, Investor's Business Daily, lots of places. Jeff is the author of nonfiction book, Death by Liberalism, The Fatal Outcome of Well-Meaning Liberal Policies. He's also the author of three science fiction novels. His books include This Side of Judgment, Full Tide of Night, and Days of Cain, which is one of my favorite, uh, possibly my favorite time travel novels of all time. One of the best science fiction time traveling novels and maybe the best science fiction examination of the Holocaust. He served as associate editor of the International Military Encyclopedia, which has been on hiatus since he stopped serving in that capacity. In addition, Jeff is one of our go-to copy editors here at Bain. From what I think you started doing Conroy in at 1920, America's Great War onward, he's been the copy editor for all of Robert Conroy's alternate history novels. And that's what we're going to discuss today. Bob Conroy's legacy is what uh, we'd like to talk about. Who was Robert Conroy? Well, in 1920. Uh, it was 1920? 1920. That was here? I th I th yeah, I think so. I I've done about half a dozen of them. Yeah, and you, um, we originally called you in just to, to look at the, all the military aspects of everything, and we and Bob liked what you had to say so much that um, we were like, let's just get him to <laughs> to copy edit these things. But let's let's just put a chain on him and make sure he doesn't escape. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and we'll discuss how big that, how thick that chain has become. Bob Conroy is the author of many alternate history novels. For Bain, he wrote Himmler's War, Rising Sun. 1920, America's Great War, Liberty, 1784, 1882, Custer and Chains, Germanica, and Thriller, Stormfront. Bob was an Army veteran, a businessman, and after retirement, a teacher for quite a few years at a college near his home outside Detroit. He taught business and economic history. He began writing alternate history after his retirement from business as well. He died in late 2014 of cancer. He was in the midst of writing his latest alternate history when he died, and he left it in an advanced but incomplete state. I had a hand in this novel in that I suggested to Bob that he set his next book in Civil War times. The truth is that Bob had several ideas about what he wanted to write next, and I said I'd love a Civil War book, and, and that's what he did, began on. So his agent, Eleanor Wood, had this unfinished manuscript. Uh, I believe it was called The Fourth Day, and it may still be called that. That's right. Uh, Bob's final work, and Bain had the perfect candidate to finish the book. We had a guy, I think, a supremely gifted fiction writer, an expert at military history, and someone who is intimately familiar with Bob Conroy's work since he was the copy editor on many of his books. So I put the idea of finishing the fourth day to Jeff Dunn, and he jumped at it. And this month, the reason that I want to talk about it particularly now is that this month uh, marks the mass market publication of 1882 Custer and Chains, which is Bob's, well, let's see, that's three back, not his penultimate, not, it's his penultimate historical alternate history. So I thought we'd talk about Bob's work in general and then discuss with Jeff how he's approaching this posthumous collaboration with Robert Conroy. So Jeff, I was once uh, talking to, to Bain publisher Tony Weisskopf about Bob Conroy's prose, and we were thinking about how it seems like it would be easy to replicate, but it's not. It's uh, it's kind of deceptively simple. Seems effortless. That's, that's it exactly. Yeah. How how do you go about trying to work with that? Simplicity, simplicity is it, it's it, it, as you say. It's something that uh, that's awfully difficult to to, to duplicate. As uh, Orwell once said, the prose should be completely pellucid and transparent. It shouldn't get in the way between the subject and the reader, which makes perfect sense. And it sounds really simple once 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 you hear it, but uh, you're trying to do it, trying to bring it off. There's another story completely, and that was uh, that. That's the real challenge in trying to duplicate how, how a writer writes. And it's, but you know, one of the advantages I had here was that I well, I had worked on like a half a dozen of uh, Conroy's novels, so so the his style, I kind of absorbed his style in a way. So it was a lot easier for me than it would have been coming in cold. Can you sort of describe what a copy editor does so that we can we can understand how intimately you get to know a work? Sure, sure. A copy editor, basically, you've got to go through the work. You've got to uh, you've got to pay close close attention to, to the prose. You got to you got to assure that it uh, that it's consistent. You have to correct errors and. Uh, 
really, that's about it. Everything else from that point is is is, is, is instinctive, and it's it's something you got to build up. And that's that's the advantage I, I had in uh, dealing with uh, with Conroy's work. That's you, that, you that, I, I, there was nothing conscious there. You create a style sheet. Yeah, that's... exactly. You create a style sheet with with the author's uh, idiosyncrasies, his habits, and so forth and so on. But it's not it's not just the the, the conscious stuff. It's the stuff that, that you pick up that you, that, that, that you can't even describe. Yeah. And that's what makes makes it relatively easy to deal to deal with with uh, with, uh, with 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 Conroy's writing, his style, his style, his, his his way of expressing himself. Yeah. So we both read a bunch of Bob's stuff. Um, he, I would say that um, one of the uh, hallmarks of of his books is he always picks out two or three viewpoint characters who carry most of the story that are fictional characters, while presenting vignettes of um, of a lot of historical characters. And usually these guys are, what, mid-level officers on both sides of a conflict, something like that. Um, the good guy's usually American, I would say. Well, yeah, naturally. I mean, how could it be any other way? But um, it's uh, usually usually mid-level, usually younger, usually starting out, and usually at conflict with the with the historical character in some way or another. Like in the in the in the Custer novel, Custer and Chains, the. Uh, Main character is a, a young U.S. Army officer who saves Custer's life at uh, Little Bighorn, which is which is basically the uh, the, the 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 inflection point. That's the, that's that's where the history breaks off. And Custer, as we know, has no gratitude whatsoever. Yeah. His entire his entire thing after that is is, is to uh, is to interfere with the guy's career, wreck his wreck his life, and so so forth and so on. Even as he goes on to bigger and higher heights, Custer eventually becomes president, and uh, that's 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 the basic conflict of the novel right there. It's not uh, it's not particularly the historical stuff, though the historical element is certainly important. It's the it, it's the conf- the character conflict between the young officer and Custer. How do you think, you know, based on your historical knowledge, how do you think Conroy did with Custer? Um, this is kind of the Thomas Berger Custer of Little Big Man, uh, in a way, wouldn't you say? Yeah, to an extent. Yeah, but, uh, but Thomas Berger was, was more or less ridiculing it. Thomas Berger was taking on the... Uh, the historical myth of you know the heroic Custer who was uh, who was uh, killed by savages for for no reason you know Custer was just out taking a ride with his boys and these uh, Sioux came out of no place and killed him for no reason right okay but uh, there was that and there was a thing that came out of the sixties where Custer was the generate white man out to, out to kill Indians and of course the the, the, the truth is somewhere in between mm-hmm. Custer was not a heroic figure by by any means he was he was in fact a bit of a nut. But he had his good points as well, and this is what uh, what uh, Conroy brought out in the, in, in, in the book. Custer is uh, Custer was a human being. He was not a symbol, and he should not be taken that way. Yeah. And well, I think I, I, I think he did a damn good job at that. I was really impressed by the by his character his characterization of Custer in there because he didn't rely on the myths, you know, the symbolism that uh, that uh, that the Custer has taken up for uh, for over a century now. Yeah, he. Um... He was, uh, for one thing, he sort of, we see Custer through his wife Libby's eyes in this book. Um, and Lib- Libby's kind of a piece of work, too, isn't she? Yeah, she's, well, she, she's like, uh, the, you know, the, the, the power behind a throne with Custer. She's the one that, that drives him on, uh, on his uh, to ever greater heights. She's living her life through Custer in a way, because naturally, needless to say, this is the 19th century. Women did not have quite the, uh, the scope for action that they've got today. And she's way smarter than him. Or he, is smarter. No question about it. <laughs> but uh, she's also a bit of a neurotic too, and that's where a lot of the action comes comes in this thing. She's in, in a way she's 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 uh, she's a tragic character, much more of a tragic character than Custer is in this book, and that's and that's subtle. That's something that you don't really often get in uh, in uh, often in history novels. As far as the characterization of the of the of the historical characters go, the icons. Yeah. The. Um, uh... He he found a way to to get at Custer that that's new and unique and is historical at the same time. Um, exactly. I liked uh, the opening of the book. The thing that sets it up is um, Custer and Libby have just been having sex <laughs> in bed, and um, <laughs> they uh, and horrible. Custer's like, "I'm bored," and she says, "Why don't you start a war?" <laughs> and, <laughs> 
So they discuss, you know, that, that that's that's how wars get started. Who they could fight, and you know, <laughs> England's out. They would whip our asses. So, uh, you know, right. Well, World War One, uh, you could you could very easily look at the fact that World War One was uh, started by a man who had a bad arm, who was the Kaiser. Mm -hmm. Spent his entire adult life making up for the fact that that, that that his arm was was messed up. He had a congenital deformity. How much do you buy into such uh, such? I mean, it's fun to talk about. Um, are you like a historical, uh, you know, the processes of history make things happen or, or or somewhere in between the great man theory? I think it's a mix. I think uh, historical determinism is it's, – it's, 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 it certainly sets the basis. You know, you've got, you, you've got your economic situations. You've got your political and geopolitical situations. Germany is always going to be a problem simply because of where it is. In Europe, Russia is always going to be the way it is because of, because of where it's located and the, uh, the 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 nature of the people, the climate, and so forth and so on. But beyond that, that more or less puts the uh, puts the cards on the table. Beyond that, you've got somebody who has to come in and play those cards. Bismarck would certainly B B Bismarck has has his relationship with the Kaiser and Hitler. They're all, they're all they're all of a general type, but Bismarck would not have been as stupid as Hitler to Hitler was, or as crazy as Hitler was. Let's, let's look at it that way. So there is there, there you you do have a mix between the course of history and what what people do with it. It's you you you're, 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 history is the river. You're on the rowboat. Mm -hmm. You can go where you want to go to a certain extent. That's that's that, that's the way I look at it. Why do people buy alternate histories? I mean, not buy them with money, but why do they? Um, why do they willingly? What is it that enables us to willingly suspend our disbelief enough to uh, to get into stories like that? Well, what ifs are interesting in and of in and of themselves. It's uh, you know a lot of people in sci-fi insist that uh, alternate history is not science fiction. It's some it's something else, which which to an extent they have an argument, but it's the same sense of speculation except for the fact that it's historical fact rather than tech yeah well conroy said in an interview with me back in uh, 2013 that um that he never would put fantasy elements or science fiction elements in it, that he thought that for instance uh, harry turtle does stuff was not really alternate history in in his conception of it uh, and I presume Eric Flint's stuff as well, in that, you know, time travel's involved. Right. That that, that I, I'd be tempted to agree with. When you go back to the, the, the original alternate history novels, and, the, the, you, know, you know, alternate history goes back a lot farther. There was a, yeah, there was a, there was a famous collection in the 30s in which various uh, statesmen and historians and so forth were called on to speculate certain uh, – Certain changes in history, and I, I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Winston Churchill actually uh, speculated on, on the Battle of Gettysburg. I may be wrong there, but I think, but I, but, but I think that is the case. But, um, but yeah, the, I would, I would, I would, I would say for pure alternate history, when you're talking about novels like Bring the Jubilee, and uh, no, not Bring the Jubilee. Ju Bring the Jubilee has time travel, but the, the Man in the High Castle, for instance. Mm -hmm. The man in the the man in the high castle is is, is pure alternate history, in which he, virtually the only thing that that, that that occurs is that the is that the Axis won World War Two. There's really not that that, that that much in the way of sci-fi elements in there, and that's 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 what, what we what we might call pure AH. Yeah, that's um, and there's like not to get off on Philip K. Dick, but there's all that discussion of what's ersatz and what's not. Um, in there that, that kind of is a comment on, um, you know, we have our memory of history and, it, you know, and, and then we have actually what occurred and, and whether they are the same thing or not. Um, oh, yeah, the, the, the guy would, uh, would uh, FDR's uh, cigarette lighter. Yeah, or not. <laughs> yeah. It matters. Um what you say? Anyway, let's not get into. It. We could go down a rabbit hole talking about Philip K. Dick. Um, so Bob once wrote that an alternate history needs to be plausible, accurate, and relevant. Um, and the relevant was kind of the hard part to to pull off. Um, I guess uh, let's talk about the the fourth day. Is that um, what we're still going to call? What do you think is a good title for this thing? You're... Well, if if I, I would go for something like the day after Gettysburg. Yeah. 
Okay. The fourth day really doesn't really doesn't express any, anything at all about what the about what the what's yeah. fourth well, day could be about anything. The thing about Bob Conroy's titles is he he, he was very good at coming up with them and he always came up with them after he finished. And so this is a book he didn't finish. Let's just um let's backtrack and and talk about what this is, this project. How did you get it? And and what did you start thinking about? How did I get it? I don't follow you. Well, um You sent it to me. Yes, I emailed it to you. That's how you got it. But I mean in, in what form is the is the novel? Um Oh okay. As I'll, Bob left it. How did it stand when I got it? Yes, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, one of the frustrating things about about uh, about uh, about Bob was the fact that he didn't outline. He didn't actually send outlines. He would have he would have notes, but you really couldn't tell where the novel was going. Now, the the good thing about this one, it was it was it was probably a good half two thirds done, and it was a the, the I got a good solid picture of of where it was going, and uh, because I'd handled his material in the past through the copy editing. I had a good idea as to how he would probably have handled it. So, so what was what's the setup? What right. is it about? What 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 it's about is 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 is, is this, this is something that a lot of this, this this is actually a point that a lot of people have uh, have debated historically. The Battle of Gettysburg, George Meade, after the battle, the uh, Army of the Potomac, the Union Army was so beat up, he decided probably very wisely, too, not to pursue Lee. Lincoln wanted him to go after Lee, not let Lee escape and, and go back to Virginia. So Meade, Meade stood back, and Lincoln, Lincoln was rather angry about this for, for some time until, until he was finally persuaded that, 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 uh, that the, that the uh, army was, 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 was so trashed that, uh, that, that, that they, could, they couldn't have, have accomplished anything catching up with Lee. In Conroy's alternate universe, me chases Lee, hits him right at the Potomac, and the the victory at Gettysburg is totally overturned. Lee, with his back to the wall, beats the hell out of uh, out of me, and as a as a result, he the the the, the Union army is, is virtually finished. It has to be dragged back and uh, and uh, re reordered, re re, re, re re virtually rebuilt. So Lee has uh, has has his uh, has his uh, complete freedom to do what he wants to, and he sticks around in Pennsylvania. He more or less marches around in Pennsylvania and just raises hell from one end of the state to the other. He's he's occupying the state, which of course enables the Confederate government to appeal to uh, European governments, Britain in particular, for support. And that's pretty much where it stood when I when I uh, when when I jumped in. So the idea is is, is how to how to take that and uh, and tie it in with with events as they occurred. As they occurred in our world, the actions of the characters in our world, U.S. Grant, Lincoln, Edwin, uh, John Wilkes Booth, I'm sorry, and, uh, and, 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 and make, it, make it come together as a convincing, a plausible history. Fortunately, Bob had, 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 had set it up enough so that it was, it was very the, – the storyline was very convincing up to that point, and I was able to take it from point G, more or less, and take it all the way to the ending. So another uh, historical character you brought in was um, it, it's not coming back. To I, uh, I I think yeah that, that's 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 Cassie. She's not historical though. She's fictional. Ca Cassie is the, Cassie is the daughter of a of a badly injured uh, Union Union officer who's who's in the state of recovery at the point, and she's uh, she's a concern concerned with, with with helping a uh, a number of, of slaves who have, who, have, who have fled from the South and really have nowhere to go. She becomes involved with the, with the, one of the main characters, a younger Union officer. She's she's kind of a blue stocking, what they what they what the, what, the, what they call a feminist in those days, and uh, very very bright, very intellectual. It's one thing you realize about uh, about uh, about Bob Conroy immediately is he writes very very strong female characters. His characters are they, they're they're not necessarily feminist in the modern sense, but they're smart. They know what they're doing. They know what they want, and they go about and do it. In the fourth day, who are the fictional characters that you that Bob set up and that you um, are working with? There's um, are we on both sides as we are in you, in most Conroy novels? Yeah, there's uh, there's a. Uh... There's a Union officer, Stephen Thorne, and there's a Confederate officer, Wade, who are kind of mirror mirror images. Mirror, they're, they're both they're both uh, 
unit commanders. They're both, they're both cavalry officers. They're both young and uh, and rather ambitious. And uh, Thorne is in, is involved with uh, with this uh, with, the, with this girl Cassie, who is the uh, the daughter of the uh, of the older officer. And the uh, the 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 development is kind of uh, is, uh, is 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 kind of set up as. Uh, uh, a little difficult to put. She more or less uh, uh, civilizes him. More or less, he's just he's just your regular regular uh, bachelor type, and she more or less brings it, pulls his head together, which is which is a good thing, because I've I've, I've got it set up that that he's that he's not. Uh, I've, I've developed the character that he's not that he's not taking the war well at all. He's headed for a good uh, solid case of PTSD, which of course was unknown at the time. And, uh, and and not recognized, but uh, but we we can look back to the Civil War and, and realize that that a, that a number of the soldiers who came home from that from the from the war were actually suffering from that or or some variant of it. And we have a um, a decent Confederate guy, and we have a really evil Confederate guy, right? Um, not really. The evil character in this one is 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 John Wilkes Booth. Oh, okay. John Wilkes Booth is, of course, he, he's 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 already scheming scheming to take down uh, Lincoln, and uh, he's he's involved with it with a with a with another character, uh, Richard Dean, who's kind. He was Richard Dean is uh, is is one of life's little yo-yos, and uh, he's he's got a very a very high opinion of himself. He's he's the type who who every every other month is involved in something new, and every every other month screws it up. And he was uh, he was the fiance to Cassie, the female character, at the beginning of the novel, until he uh, deserts from the Union Army. At which point, she won't have anything to do with him. And he's uh, he's more or less at loose ends, and he falls in with Booth, so he becomes part oh, of okay. Booth's conspiracy against Lincoln. And Booth is, I think, it rather competently uh, portrayed, right? Yeah, Booth is Booth is well handled. Booth is. Uh, He's 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 one of the boogeymen of American history, so he's another one that people have a rather distorted distorted image of. But he was actually he was he was he was the he was the Tom Cruise of his time. He was incredibly popular, recognized by everybody, and uh, and quite quite capable, and could have had himself a good good long solid, solid career if he if he if he hadn't been slightly crazy. Mm. Well, actually, more than slightly crazy, completely crazy. And his. Uh... His, his brother was um, was a unionist who yeah, his, suffered because of what his brother did. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, as a matter of fact, I introduced that in a later scene. I have him send a letter to uh, to the uh, to the uh, Cassie's family apologizing for it huh. from for for his brother Edwin Booth. Mm -hmm. But uh, there, I, I, there, there was another one too, Richard Booth, I think. They were, they were both unionists. The Booths were, I mean, they were brothers. They were like. Uh, uh, quite the uh, theatrical family at, at the time. Yeah, the, the the other the other brother was a theater was a theater owner. I think he owned a th owned, owned theaters in Baltimore and Washington D.C. He's a guy who wanted to be an actor, but he didn't have any talent, so he went into the business end. So, what about your Lincoln and Conroy's Lincoln? What what do you where are you going to take that? Well, Lincoln Lincoln is, is is another mythic figure that's who's who's really difficult to bring down to the human level because because every, everybody Lincoln's one of those people everybody has an impression of everybody has their own private personal Lincoln so all you can really do is stick with the record and just just try to make sure that the myth doesn't take over and I've, I think I've done a pretty good job on that I, I, I did manage to discover a few things about Lincoln that uh, that are not particularly well known. For instance, as a young man, he was the wrestling champion of the state of Kentucky. Hmm. A little hard. In the prototypical WWE. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. He was a, he was a mixed martial arts uh, champion of the uh, of the uh, 1830s, more or less. Uh, he 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 won like 400 uh, wrestling matches. Drew, maybe drew a couple, but was never defeated. Yeah. So Lincoln was hard. Think hard of that, man. You, yeah, exactly. You know, he was he was he was hard and he was he he was tough. I mean, you know, people look at him as you know being the tragic figure, all dressed in black and and so forth and so on. But there was a lot more to him. 
he was he was three dimensional. He had uh, he, he had his he, he had his own life, his own way of doing things. And of course, once I discovered that, I was able to use that to slip it into the uh, into the book. I, I do I do have a feeling it would have become very uh, it would have been very uh, very handy in, in zombie hunting too. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Lincoln a, is a prototype, I mean, he's a polymorphously uh, useful in fiction, it seems. But who are some of the other historical figures we meet? Do we meet um, uh, Grant? Grant, yes. Grant, Grant, of course, is, is, is difficult to handle because he's so closed. He was such a private person. Very difficult to get into, the, to get into his head or, 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 or figure out what he was thinking. Which, which, so, the, so the solution there is not to get into his head, just show his actions, mm -hmm. which, is, which, is, which is how you can handle it here. And also Robert E. Lee, of course. Lee is another one who's, who's, who's a mythic figure. And... Uh, Lee's problem is that is that if you take a look at it from the from the from the point of view of the South, he was the he was the, he was the perfect knight, and nothing terrible, nothing bad can be said about him, which is uh, which it, 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 it's perfectly understandable, and you can't you can't blame people whatsoever for for having that particular idea, but it it, it did it does make him a little bit inhuman, so you really have to be careful about how you handle a character the character of Lee. A lot of people were offended when Gettysburg came out, the movie on Michael Shara's novel. Because uh, they 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 uh, because basically because of the because of the scene where he's arguing with with Longstreet James Longstreet about the uh, about the attack on, on Gettysburg because a lot of people couldn't accept that he could be mistaken on that level, which of course is is but the, of course it, it's it's what happened historically. Apparently Lee was extremely ill mm -hmm. at the, that 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 weekend, and he wasn't he he he, he just wasn't thinking straight, and he more or less ordered the attack out of uh, out of uh, just uh, just uh, just just an impulse. Which he later, of course, uh, stated was uh, was an error. But uh, it's 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 a bit of a challenge to uh, to take on a character like that and uh, deal with him. And it's 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 good when it comes across as satisfactory. I don't know if people are going to particularly care for my my Lee, more or less, my interpretation of Lee. But I think I've handled it rather well. Well, I mean, um, Longstreet was always on Lee's case, right? I mean. <laughs> He did not buy into oh, well, the myth well, of his time. I didn't, didn't buy into the myth. Well, he, I mean, he, he he was of course you know loyal general, but he often was critical of Lee. Well, Longstreet was really confident. He was a really capable general, but he was he was also a bit of a conniver. Mm -hmm. He sent him out west to uh, assist uh, Joseph Johnston. Against uh, against Sherman mm -hmm. in 1864, and uh, and there was there was some kind of conspiracy against Johnston by his his junior officers, and Longstreet instead of instead of going in there and quelling it and straightening things out, he joined the conspiracy. Now there's there's no telling whether he wanted to take over Johnston's army or or what, but uh, but it's but it's a but it's a pretty asinine thing, and uh, and it's, it's it's something he shouldn't have done. He shouldn't have been involved in. And it's 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 it really kind of colors your attitude toward him. Even though he's a he's a really admir admirable figure in other ways. After the war, he uh, he actually he actually he actually threw in with the with the uh, with the uh, with the new government and to try to try to persuade the people people to uh, to work with. Okay, okay, we're back in the United States. We have to go with it. We have to play the cards we're dealt. Let's uh, let let let's make the best of it we can. As, as a matter of fact, a lot of people accuse him of being a traitor. Which is not wrong. So, 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 uh, so, in, so, in, in a lot of ways, he's, uh, he's 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 an admirable figure with with some very serious flaws. But that's another one. He's another one who appears in the novel, and he's another one that it's, that it's, it was a real pleasure to, to deal with. Put him in this new situation, see how he'd behave. Now, do we have? Do we meet my favorite Civil War general, who is um, Sherman? Does he come? Does he show up? Featured in there. He doesn't. He doesn't actually show up, but uh, but he's part of uh, Grant's master plan. For uh, for arresting uh, Lee out of uh, Pennsylvania and ending the war, well, a lot of, if, you, if you take a look back at the Civil War, what a lot of people don't realize is that is that uh, is that Grant had a an overall plan for ending the war in 1864, and it was screwed up by his incompetent uh, lower generals, his juniors. Mm -hmm. He was he was he was going to send Sherman into into, into Georgia. He was going to have Benjamin Butler take on Fort Fisher, which was the last big, uh, big uh, Confederate de 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 defensive fortification on the coast. And he was going to have Banks take Mobile. 
that that would that would have cut the South off from every uh, from every possible support coming from the outside, and it would have more or less uh, turned it turned it into uh, completely isolated. It turned it turned it to turn turned a very bad situation absolutely hopeless. But uh, Banks to instead turned around and took off for Texas, and Butler was a but Butler was a lovable screw up of the Civil War. He he never accomplished anything, but it's but it's impossible to hate him for it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I kind of duplicated that 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 setup here in the uh, in in the fourth day by having Grant go in and, uh, and 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 challenge Lee in Pennsylvania, more or less more or less just 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 just, just grab him so he can't do anything else, so he can't um, he can't send reinforcements, he can't he can he can't he can't act tactically or in, or anything, and then have Sherman march over the Kentucky hills into Virginia. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an alternate history version of uh, of the of the vast plan that it, that he had that he had in our world. Yeah. Well, Lee was stealing a march on Sherman, as it were, by uh, tearing the hell out of Pennsylvania. That's that's the exactly name. that's that, that's so that's a real cool idea. That kind of overturns the thing. That that uh, that, that takes our history and uh, and more or less turns it inside out in a way. So what? Um, just can you quickly? What is the actual history? Uh, after Gettysburg, it was the high tide of the South. You know, I mean, some even pinpoint what Pinckney's charge as that was it. <laughs> that was the peak, and then yeah, that's uh, well. It's uh, there's a great uh, quote from William Faulkner who uh, who once said uh, for 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 many men living in the South, it is it is always going to be nine oh five on uh, on on uh, July July third eighteen sixty three, which is the moment the Pinckney's charge starts. <laughs> mm-hmm. And that's yeah, it it is definitely part part of the mythology. But of course, the the the, the point in in our world, Lee got away. He got back to Virginia. The Meade made, attempted several other uh, advances against uh, against Lee in Virginia that, that failed for various reasons. And uh, what, uh, what a lot of people, it, it's been uh, it's, thanks very much to Bruce Catton. It has been overlooked that the real serious victory that weekend, that's the first week of July, 63, occurred in Vicksburg almost the same day. It was the day after. Grant took Vicksburg. That split the South in two, and that more or less guaranteed that that that, that, yeah. uh, that no matter what Lee did from that point on, he wasn't going to succeed. Mm-hmm. And that also made Grant the leading general in the, uh, in the Union forces. And made it inevitable that he was that he was eventually going to take going to take over the uh, the, uh, the the total command of the army, which he did, of course, in 1864. And he might have, as, as I was as I was mentioning earlier, he had, he had the plan, and he might have shut the war down in 1864 if it wasn't for complete ineptness on the on the part of uh, his officers. But of course, he uh, prevailed. Kept the uh, the the offensive against against Lee's forces in Virginia going when a lot of people thought it was impossible, and finally ended the war. The war, I'm, you know, it went on for about a year longer than it than it should have gone on, even under the under the best circumstances, and long after the South could have uh, could have really really gotten anything out of it. Yeah. It's one of the tragedies of American history. The South shouldn't should not have ended up in the, in, the, in the state that it did. Let's, let's face it, the whole area was uh, was uh, was uh, on its knees for for nearly a century afterwards, which is a lot of what a lot of people neglect when they consider the South. You know, you have the mythology about oh, the South is back where the Ku Klux Klan all this other, all this other stuff. It was a defeated country. It was a country that had been, that had been defeated and beaten up as badly as any country in history. Oh, sure. And I mean, that's uh, you know, it, it, I think that Sherman is probably responsible for the South becoming uh, a series of banana republics. Um, having grown up in Alabama, I can I can say this without <laughs> and, and remembering well uh, the Wallace years from my from my childhood, I can say that um, that um, the legacy of Sherman's march was uh, was still there in the 1960s and early 70s. But um, yeah, Sherman uh, Sherman is by far the most fascinating of the Civil War generals to me, just psychologically, um, and the fact that he didn't well, he didn't want to do any. I mean, he he went out west to play cowboy and Indians, but he also knew his limits. 
to uh, Sherman was uh, the one thing you have to keep in mind with, with, with Sherman is that that he was extremely uh, Grant had absolutely no doubts whatsoever. He had absolutely he, Grant knew exactly what he was going to do, and he and he, and he went out and did it. Sherman, on the other hand, was extremely insecure. Right, well, he was like Hamlet to. Um... Yeah, exactly, exactly. Very, very much a Hamlet figure. And uh, and the, the the surprising thing is, this guy, he he nearly had a nervous breakdown early in the war, mm-hmm. and he was he was almost thrown out of the army for being crazy. And then he turns around and, and uh, brings off one of the most risky risky uh, campaigns that, that anybody has ever seen. Everybody in the world expected he was just going to disappear. He was he, that there may be two or three of his of his of his troops would stagger out of Georgia. Instead, he 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 he, he took the state and he and, and he, he 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 gutted it. He burned down Georgia. He completely defeated every force that that, that that came at him. It's it's just if if you look back and it's it's, it's astonishing. It's 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 something that that probably was not done by by anybody else in history. Going back to Alexander. Yeah, and Sherman needed a Grant to provide that stability and and the backup. That's a very good insight. Absolutely. And uh, Sherman admitted that himself. He said uh, he said once he said you know uh, I stood by Grant when he was drunk. And he stood by me when I was crazy, and now we stand together always. Yeah. So there's no question that they were they were a team, and uh, and it's p- very possible that, that they, they couldn't have brought brought off what they did bring off alone. They could they could o- only have done it together. They can their 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 actions can only be judged together. Well, what's been the um, back to the 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 book that we will see? I'm hoping in uh, 2017, perhaps. Um, what is uh, what's been the most fun and the hardest part of, of working on this thing? The hardest part for for, for me in any of these in any in, in any books of this type are the battle scenes. I find battle scenes very difficult. I don't know why, but uh, but writing them convincingly is is a little hard for me. I realize for for a number of other writers that they 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 just they just can't get enough of it. They could, if if it was left up to them. And, and this is particularly true of a lot of Bane writers, as I'm, as, as I'm sure you know. Every every book would be a battle scene, seven hundred page battle scene. But uh, but for me, for me, I find it hard. Mm-hmm. Well, what's what's been fun? Well, do you have a do you have a uh, nagging worry about accuracy, or just uh, a squeamishness in depicting eyeballs being blown out of heads? Or what? <laughs> that's that's pro- that's probably it. That's probably it. It's, it's just you know, uh, it, I tend to feel for the character a little, a little more than I should. So, uh, well, Conroy's so, Conroy's so, so battle I, scenes are frequently pretty, um, pretty explicitly gory. He doesn't shy back from from depicting the the horrors of war. Right, but the, but the good thing about Conroy is, he, is is it's not it's not meant to be sadistic. It's not meant to have any. It's, it's he's 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 just showing you, he's just showing you the the way it is. He's not taking it taking it as as, as being some particularly uh, attractive or interesting, which is which is one good thing about his work too. Yeah. Well, what what have you enjoyed? The the enjoyment of this has really been uh, figuring out the characters. The, the 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 these these are the real life characters, the Lincolns and Lees. And fitting them into this this new malo, how how they would re would have reacted to certain things, how they how 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 things would have would have affected them, and how they would have would have come back. In particular, what I really enjoyed was was taking certain things that had happened in this in our timeline and in, in the things as they really happened, and more or less giving them echoes in that timeline, giving giving them kind of mirror images. For you, for instance, you were talking about uh, just just a little while ago about uh, how Lee kind of kind of took the place of Sherman, doing to Pennsylvania what Sherman had had, had done to Georgia. There's a, a number of other elements that you can slip in in there. For instance, when Grant finally confronts Lee toward the toward the uh, later parts of the book. I was able to take certain aspects of, of the Overland campaign. That is, that is the campaign that, that against uh, the Grant uh, of Grant against against Lee in Virginia in our world, and and put them in to in, and put put them into this context. You follow what I'm saying? I'm not, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm, and it would have a it would it would cast a, a slightly different because of the context. Um, it might be perceived a, yeah, but, but, a bit differently. 
Yeah, but, but Grant would act the same way. He would, he would oh, do I see. Yeah. the same thing, even even though he's doing it in Pennsylvania yeah. rather than Virginia. Right. Especially Grant would act the same way. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, he would he would have he he would, he would try to do the same thing, and Lee would have responded the same way, and Lincoln would have would have would have would have been uh, viewing things the same way. So 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 it's 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 like it's you you could take these echoes of the history as it happened and more or less put them. Into this new context, and I, I think it has, it has a little bit of three dimensionality to it, and really uh, kind of brings brings it to life, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, um, what else have you been working on lately? Well, basically, uh, basically, just uh, n- 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 nothing fictional. I've got some ideas, but I haven't, but I haven't put them into. Uh, I've, I've just barely put a word on paper for any of them. But uh, after this, we shall see. Mm-hmm. Because I haven't, I, I haven't read, really written written a, a lot, any, any fiction to speak of for the last uh, for for quite some time, as you well know. But uh, after after this, maybe maybe uh, you know, it's 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 like it's, it's it's like junk. You know, I got it back in my veins again, and uh, like maybe maybe I'll have the monkey on my back. <laughs> well, this has been my grand plan all along, just to bring you back into uh, into writing science fiction. I think you know, I, I think you're one of the best writers of the '90s for sure. And uh, we need you back. I'm pulling, <laughs> I'm pulling Susan Matthews and you back into uh, into this. Uh, that's my my great plan. My two favorite writers from the '90s. Um, Matthews, really? Yeah, yeah. We're gonna um, bring back her uh, age. What's that? I haven't ever uh, come across her in a dog's age. Yeah, uh, we're bringing back her. Um, her uh, Inquisitor novels, uh, the Jurisdiction novels, and she's written a new one. That um, that I, I mean, this is the only universe she ever writes in, and um, I really think it's uh, uh, the new one is great, and the old ones were just uh, fantastic. Some, uh, you know, I think some of them approach literature. So, um, it, one of my great projects here, and and she's just cool as hell as a as a writer and a person. Um, so, uh, we should, you know, I should mention that, you know, we've been, we have never met physically, but we have been friends for many, many years. Um, that's that's very strange. Yeah. That was back in the early nineties, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we, uh, we both started out writing for, uh, Orson Scott Card's fanzine, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, You did a review of Scott Hart's for him. Which is one of my early short stories, mm-hmm. and it was a really impressive review, and, and it really came at it came at a critical time too, and uh, and it's that that's that's how we uh, how we how we first got in contact. Yeah. And we used to write letters a lot. Um, we cut, we sort of fell out of that over time, but um, you uh, my novel met a planetary. You gave me a, a huge amount of advice, which I just took verbatim right out of your uh, your notes. To me. <laughs> which which was about who? It was about who? Uh, was that? But Sherman. It was about Sherman. It, right? Yes, it was actually. <laughs> w. T. Sherman. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I have. Uh, but I also, was... see everything. Everything ties in. It's like it's like yeah. the, the, the you know the, 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 there's a pattern that the mystics are, are absolutely correct. Yeah, I did. I mean, basically, I said, "What if we had Sherman in a in a science fiction civil war? What would he do?" Um, and uh, that's that's where the genesis of that that book came from, but all the cool like crap you can do militarily with nanotechnology, I just basically said, "Tell me, Jeff, <laughs> some stuff," and I just uh, developed it from there. Really, I, I mean, uh, I know you've taken a detour into uh, into nonfiction and political essays, and uh, it's been you write great stuff frequently reprinted stuff but i would love to see you come back to fiction and i'm really glad that you're doing it with this uh this effort with um completing bob conroy's um final final work well this has been enough fun so uh so we'll see the problem of course is just to get rolling the problem is 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 is, is, is to get started with me it's always once 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 I'm, I'm rolling along things go fine but just getting off the dime that's that's the challenge yeah well, getting paid for things is also always. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's a good. Thing. That's that's another point. It's, well, <laughs> everybody's like, you know, why don't you write this or that? It's like, well, I'd have to spend a year writing it with no money. That's why. Yeah, exactly. 
I'll just write what Tony tells me she would like. So, anyway, um, the author we are talking with is J.R. Dunn. His science fiction novels can be found in ebook form at Bain eBooks and elsewhere. His nonfiction book, Death by Liberalism, is also available at booksellers everywhere. The wonderful author we have been discussing is alternate history master Robert Conroy. Robert Conroy is the author of Himmler's War, Rising Sun, Liberty, 1784, 1920, America's Great War, 1882, Custer and Change, which is out now at booksellers everywhere in mass market, Germanica and Stormfront, all Bain books. Jeff, thanks very much for being with us and talking about Bob Conroy. Thank you, Tony. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of John Ringo's Under a Graveyard Sky. This portion of Under a Graveyard Sky is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Now here is another segment of John Ringo's novel, of zombie infestation and the heroic humans who fight back, determined to pull the world from disaster and humanity itself from the brink of annihilation. It's all taking place under a graveyard sky. Day 4 Faith stood under the decontamination shower and made a motion with one hand for more. Day 6. Okay, seriously, like how many of these damn things are there? Day 9. This is why I hate 556. Five, five, Faith fired three more times. Oh, just die already. As the supply of rounds for the Smith's AK variants dwindled, they had switched to the Coast Guard's M4s, which used a much smaller 5.56 five, millimeter round. The arguments for or against 5.56 five, were complex, but the fact that it generally took multiple rounds to stop one of the infected was notable. You need to shoot them in the head, Fontana said, double tapping a zombie. On the other hand, a team had finally found the key for the Campbell's ammunition magazine, which had a plentiful supply of 5.56. Five, the United States started to go downhill when it changed from a round designed to kill the enemies of our glorious republic to one designed to piss them off, Faith said, shooting a zombie five times, then walking up and shooting the still thrashing infected in the head. Seriously? Just die, okay? Seriously. It's legal to marry at 14 in Arkansas. Fine, Faith said, double tapping a zombie that had reared up out of the darkness. If we clear Arkansas by the time I'm 14, we'll talk. That's not fair. Day 11. Okay, Faith said, laying down fire with an MG240 off the Campbell. This is more like it. They'd finally cleared the passenger areas all the way to the top of the ship. The top deck was mostly open and a perfect place to use a machine gun, especially from the top of a water slide. Happiness is a belt-fed gun, Fontana said, grinning. Remember, short controlled bursts or the bear will overheat. That's gotta be a design flaw. What's the fun of short controlled bursts? Eh, Faith said, stepping out of the stairwell. Back in the dark again. The passenger areas were entirely clear, except for the few emaciated survivors in the cabins, there had been no uninfected individuals. Now it was time to work on the crew areas. All clear if we find zombies, Faith said. But if there's nobody who answers a knock, I'm just gonna let somebody else check the cabin. Hopefully down here, they'll all have died of dehydration, Steve said. The zombies, that is. Trixie doesn't want to know about the cabins, Faith said. We get it, honey, Fontana said. We'll check the cabins. As a senior maintenance officer, Robert Rob Cooper didn't have access to all the supply areas, technically. But as a senior maintenance officer, what he did have was a lot of friends willing to look elsewhere when he turned up with a dolly. Besides, everybody was doing it. Everybody knew that things were going to shit, 
You only had to be around one person who turned to realize that this was really and truly bad. And everybody was stocking their cabins. Rob didn't stock his cabin. He stocked a maintenance locker. For one thing, it was closer to the supplies area. For another, it had a white water line running right through it that was below the line of the water supply. And it wasn't anything tough for a guy who'd worked his way up as an engineer to run a quick fitting into the line. In other circumstances, that would be an automatic firing offense and really, really stupid. After two months in the darkened maintenance shack, he was so glad he'd ignored both regulation and common sense. And so was Gwyn. He'd run into the staff side third officer while trying to make it to the lifeboats. Unlike a lot of the ship side officers, he'd stayed on the ship with the passengers, right up until the abandoned ship call, which had been made by staff. And when he'd headed to the lifeboats, in a zombie apocalypse, he'd gone prepared. The crowbar was how he'd beat his way most of the way to the lifeboats before finding out from Gwyn that they were all gone. She'd protested heading to his hideout. She'd been bitten at the boats, and then again, from a zombie he beat off of her. Then there was the blood splatter from the beating. But he'd insisted. He didn't know why even then. Maybe it was the thought of such a pretty lady becoming a zombie, or being eaten by them. And he kept in the back of his mind that he had a crowbar, and a bunch of painting plastic, if it came to it. But in the end, she'd accompanied the burly 53-year-old engineering officer into the bowels of the ship. It had been fortunate he'd brought her with him. They were halfway to the forward maintenance shed when the full lockdown hit. Even his car didn't work, which pissed him off. Maintenance, as he mentioned to her at the time, was supposed to have access to the whole ship, especially in an emergency. But Gwyn's continued to work all the way to the shed. It had been touch and go with Gwyn. She'd gotten real sick. Fortunately, he had plenty of water to feed her and a pretty decent supply of medicine. He'd had a lot of friends in the crew. But she was a tough lady. Easy on the ice, until the lights cut out on day three. Easy on other areas, as the months went by. The months was starting to be a problem. He'd thought he'd stocked enough food for pretty much any reasonable period, and they'd been careful with it. But he realized that it was no five-year stock. Eventually, they were going to run out. And being in a compartment, even one as large as this, with anyone, even someone with as much common sense and decency as Gwyn, occasionally made you contemplate the crowbar. I spy with my eye, Rob said. If you ever want to have another something that also starts with a B, don't even think about it, Gwyn said. Queen Bishop to Knight 4. Queen to Rook 5. Check. Your bishop is at King 6, right? Right. Damn. King Bishop to... He paused as there was a strange sound in the distance. You know, even if all the zombies would go away, fixing this thing is going to be a shipyard job. I doubt there's much use for a... She stopped as there was a distinct rhythmic clanging in the distance. Was that? Shave and a haircut? Rob said, rolling to his feet. He didn't even have to fumble his way around the compartment anymore. He walked to the hatch and started banging on it regularly. Come on, he said, banging harder. I don't care if you're fucking pirates. I sort of do, Gwen said, then paused. No, I've changed my mind. I'm fine with pirates. Nothing, Faith said, lowering the steel pipe. You want to check it? They'd found some survivors in the crew cabins. Some of them weren't even in horribly bad shape. The crew had, it turned out, been stocking up. And several of the cabins that were empty had quite a bit of stores. Some of them even had stuff that was sort of comical in a black way. One of the steward's quarters had five pounds of caviar in it. Fontana had pointed out that caviar was originally designed to be long storage and was a good source of protein. Faith had learned two things that day. That and beluga caviar was icky, even on some really expensive kind of cracker. Roger, Fontana said, keying the lock. As he did, there was a distant clanging. Customers? Faith said. Seriously? 
Sounds like it's coming from forward, Fontana said, moving down the corridor. Try it again. Faith banged on the walls, hard, and was rewarded with more banging. Guy's in good condition, Faith said. This way, Fontana said, continuing. They followed the sound around a cross corridor to a door marked Forward Maintenance Support. Figured it would be a food supply locker, Fontana said, keying the door. He'd stood to the side to keep from blinding the people. He popped a chem light and tossed it through the door. That was another segment in our complete audiobook serialization of Under a Graveyard Sky by John Ringo. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Rachel Mintel, Christopher Rocchio, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And an accurate reproduction of the pistol used by John Wilkes Booth on Lincoln at the Ford Theater, along with the contact number for Booth's great-great-great-grandnephew, who works as an Uber driver in Washington, D.C., and is the only human alive with the power to take down the rampaging statue of Lincoln, risen from his chair in the monument that's crushing cars and their inhabitants along the Capitol Mall, as if they were just ants and headed for the White House. The decision on how to use those materials is up to you, Jeff Dunn. And our thanks for discussing Robert Conroy's alternate histories, including New Mass Market 1882, Custer in Chains, to J.R. Dunn, soon to be co-author of the final Robert Conroy alternate history novel set during the height of the American Civil War. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. 